it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I found out the secret behind the mandatory summer camp in my town. It's more horrifying than I could ever imagine. It's been a year since I escaped my town and the horrifying secret it's kept. I want to share my experience with you, but it's more for my benefit. I want to put it in words so I can accept it. I was 13 years old when I first saw a kid try and escape. Clara Danvers was a senior at Aceville High School. She wore pastel colours and flower crowns in her hair. I didn't know her very well since I attended the middle school down the road, but I knew she was one of the most popular girls in her class. Clara was the type all girls in our town aspired to be. Her beauty wasn't eye-catching in a town like Aceville, where all of its teens were ridiculously attractive. Oh, and uh, camp was mandatory in Aceville. At the time, I wasn't sure why. All I knew was that all 18-year-olds were obligated to attend camp for the remainder of their summer before college. And yes, you'd be right in thinking it's practically a human rights violation. It was their summer. Aceville's teens were teetering on the edge of adulthood and responsibilities. Their teen years and beloved childhood is dwindling, and that last summer meant a lot to them. Of course they fought back. Clara Danvers didn't strike me as a rebel. She looked like the type of girl who followed all the rules and joined as many extracurriculars as possible. She had the perfect friends, the perfect boyfriend, perfect A's, and was Harvard-bound, thanks to word of mouth travelling around. However, on July 16th, 2016, I saw a different sight to her. Oh, the memory's vague, though I remember small tidbits. I remember being in the store with my mother. I remember it being a hot day, the kind of heat that I hated. It was too warm to think straight, and all I wanted to do was sit in my garden and read. Didn't exactly have a choice whether I accompanied my mother. Oh, she would blackmailed me with the reward of getting a new comic. Mum had been talking to the cashier. She was friends with half the town, so I wasn't surprised when every person she passed by said hello, shooting a smile at me. I remember being bored. I needed to pee, and I was at that point in my life when I was wary of being seen shopping with my mom. It was pretty much social suicide for a 7th grader to be seen with her mom. So, keeping my head down and pulling my baseball cap further over my face, I digressed to the comic book section. All of my favourites were there, and I had $10 to spend. I was in my element. Skimming through Spider-Man issues, I found myself captivated by the colours. Spider-Man was a kid's comic, I knew that. I'd made the mistake of pulling one out of my backpack at school, only for Summer Forest to snatch it out of my hands and hold it up in the air, a wicked smile on her face. <laughs> you still read Spider-Man? No, I'd snap back, my cheeks burning bright. Liar, Summer snorted. You still read Spider-Man? <laughs> Isn't that a kid's comic? Well, I'm not going to say it was traumatizing, some kids had laughed along, and some had ignored Summer. I snatched the comic off of her and shoved it back in my bag. Then, on the way to class, I'd shoved it in the trash. I still wasn't completely healed from that incident, so ignoring a smiling Mary Jane in a funky lab coat, I moved on to the more adult comics. Well, they were adult in my kid brain, at least. Picking up Teen Titans, I flipped it over and scanned the back. Mum was still chatting to the cashier and my urge to pee wasn't going away. I figured stepping outside to cool off would be a good idea, even when I knew I was just stepping back into the baking heat, away from the pathetic cooling fan sitting near the door. My plan was to go back to the car and blast the AC. Mum was going to be in there for a while. I could tell by the way she was leaning against the counter, already making her roots. I was sliding into Mum's car, Try not to wince when my bare leg sunk into the hot leather, when a scream rang out, startling me. When I twisted around, scanning the parking lot in front of the store, I saw her. Clara Danvers, dressed in shorts and t-shirt, her sneakers pounding against the steaming tarmac, her strict blonde ponytail flying behind her. Clara was running for her life. And at first, I thought she was running from some kind of animal. Coyote attacks were common, 
but not in broad daylight. Except Clara wasn't running from an animal. I recognised Mrs. Peters, one of the high school teachers. Mom had been friendly with her. Now Mrs. Peters was in her mid-forties and wore thick sweaters in 90-degree heat. The last thing I thought I'd ever see was the teacher sprinting after the retreating senior, a kind of look in her eyes that I'd known my whole life, replaced with a look of intense determination. It was almost comical. Like I was watching a cartoon. I laughed. Well, I felt bad, but it was hard to ignore the hysterical spew of laughter crawling up my throat. Clara was a good runner. Maybe she was on the track team. Though Mrs. Peters, amazingly, was faster. Well, she was in good shape for her age, long strides catapulting her further forwards, swinging arms, driving momentum. Clara Danvers! Well, the teacher wasn't out of breath, though neither was Clara. Neither of them were giving up. Watching this bizarre display, I found myself following them, though I was slower, darting behind parked cars, keeping myself hidden. There was something clutched in Clara's hand. When she brought it to her ear, her eyes were wide and wild, lips moving frantically, and I realized she was talking to someone. When Clara twisted around to scan for the teacher, I knew she'd made a mistake. I watched the scene unravel in front of me like it was going in slow motion. Clara's phone slipped from her grasp and she let out a sharp cry, ducking to try and snatch it back up. But the teacher was on her tail. Miss Danvers, you are acting like a child, the woman chastised, reaching out and snatching the girl by the back of her t-shirt. Clara shrieked and tried to battle her way out of the teacher's grip, but Mrs. Peter's grip was harsh, her fingernails sticking into the bare flesh of Clara's arms. G get off me! The girl was acting like a caged animal. Didn't understand. It was just camp, right? I understood Clara and her class not wanting to go because it was their last summer to be free and be kids again. Maybe the girl was acting dramatic, but I could empathize with her. I watched Mrs. Peters drag the girl, spitting and cursing, away. I can still remember their words. Clara Danvers didn't swear, at least that's what I thought. She was the golden girl, after all. But Clara was yelling names, presumably those of her friends. And Mrs. Danvers was laughing. Miss Danvers, please calm down. You know you have to attend camp, and we were very clear at the assembly that we would take necessary measures to make sure every senior is on that bus. Clara dug the soles of her converse into the tarmac. She reminded me of a petulant child throwing a tantrum. I don't want to go to camp. What the hell is wrong with you? I'm not a kid anymore. You are a part of this town as well as the high school, which means rules still apply. I'm 18. Mrs. Peters ignored her outburst. As I said, you are still a student. Therefore, you are expected to follow rules. One of our town's rules is that the senior class will attend a mandatory summer camp before college. This has been going on for years, Miss Danvers. I expected more from a class valedictorian. You've been one of the smartest in your class since your freshman year, Clara. I did not expect this lack of intelligence from you. Do not ruin your reputation by acting like a child. Clara sputtered. What did you just say? The two of them were getting further away, and all I could do was watch their shadows stretch across the sidewalk. I was debating whether to follow them to wherever they were going, but then a hand was grabbing my shoulder. I twisted around and found my mother. Well, she didn't look mad or confused. Mum didn't question why I'd disappeared. Instead, her gaze had snapped to where I'd been watching Clara and the teacher. Her eyebrows furrowed, her lip curling like she was about to say something before seemingly snapping out of it. Mum shoved paper bags of groceries into my arms with a light smile and I struggled to get a strict hold of them. She was looking at me, but I could have sworn her gaze was wandering, searching for something. Did you pick a comic book? Managing to find my voice, I shook my head. Well, I felt kind of sick. Clara Danvers hadn't had a choice whether she went to camp or not. None of her class did. And when they tried to skip out, they were treated like animals. Or for <laughs> what? A few weeks in the sun with the senior class, the town's murky lake and mosquitoes. 
couldn't understand why it was mandatory. No other town forced their kids to go to camp, so why did ours? I tried to smile at Mom. They're all childish. I mean, can we just go home? Mom looked like she was going to protest, but not it. She had that expression, the one I dreaded. The one when she was trying to read me, delving into my mind. Well, I wasn't exactly a talkative kid, so my mum turned into my therapist, constantly demanding to know how I was feeling. On that occasion, however, it was different. She paid no attention to my sickly cheeks and the lump in my throat. All right, are you sure you're okay? I don't know how I managed, but I did keep my mouth shut and nod, following mum back to the car. Well, it's not like Aceville's bizarre rule was a secret. I just didn't want to talk about it. Neither did Mom, from the look on her face. Instead of grilling me like usual, she took me for a chocolate fudge sundae at our local diner. I still remember the sickly feeling in my stomach when I struggled to swallow it, washing it down with flat coke, which made me feel worse. I tried hard to pretend everything was okay, but I couldn't stop thinking about Clara and the way she'd been treated. Dread filled me like poison, shivers rattling up and down my spine. I couldn't sit still. Was that my future? Was I going to be hunted down like that? Well, that's what I kept thinking. When Mom was talking excitedly about her plans for our next family vacation, I was discreetly counting on my fingers how many years I had before I turned 18. Until Clara, until seeing her dragged like an animal by a teacher I considered one of the nicest people in town, well, I'd look forward to turning 18. It was the age of independence, the peak of teenagehood. Though, excitement turned to dread. I never saw Clara again. Or the class of 2016. It's a well-known fact that freshly graduated kids go to camp and then straight to college. But I still found it strange. Once they were gone, the town forgot them and turned their attention to the new senior class. Watched this happen for five years. Kids followed in Clara's footsteps. She'd started the rebellion after all, though none of them came close to escape like her. Watched them tear through the woods, laughing and whooping like it was child's play. The girls stripped down to two-piece swimsuits and, in 2018, Mikey Blake Street. When it turned into a game, Clara's story spread like a virus and seniors took it as an opportunity to one-up her. I guess it became less of something to be scared of and more to anticipate. Well, sure, no kid wanted to be stuck at summer camp, but it was the hunt beforehand that excited them. Well, they were always caught, always wrestled to the ground and treated just like Clara Danvers. Over the years, however, it became less scary to watch and more exciting. Like watching the latest blockbuster. And who didn't want to watch kids chased by teachers with way too much time on their hands? I watched them year after year and acted like it was a game. My friends and I made bets on who would and who wouldn't get caught. We sat on the side of the sidewalk, with beers and burgers from the diner, cheering them on. We didn't pay attention to how they were treated. In our minds, it was fun. Aceville felt like it was stuck in limbo between the 1980s and the present. I'm well, sure we had cell phones and TikTok, but my aunt and uncle drove a jalopy. Our local diner had a 50s aesthetic, and half the town didn't even have televisions. Maybe they preferred to stay in the old days. Well, it's not like I was complaining. I liked it. I liked that we were different from other towns. We were small. Our population under 5,000. Aceville. An idealistic town where there were more teens than adults. My friend Nick used to joke that it was like living in the world of stranger things, and I had to agree. Luckily, though, we weren't under threat from aliens from different dimensions and teenagers with the carry light powers. Five years after Clara, after watching the same shit year after year, it was finally our turn. The class of 2020. I was standing in the exact same store I'd been in five years ago when I first saw Clara. When I first witnessed the hunt. This time, however, I wasn't with my mother. I had managed to score a part-time job to pay for college, and I just finished my shift. 
Smells Like Teen Spirit was playing for the millionth time that day on the crabby intercom radio. My boss couldn't afford a decent one, so the quality was pretty bad. Thankfully, the store was empty that afternoon. It was a hot July summer day, and the majority of the town, minus my class, were at the local swimming pool cooling off. Once again, it was the kind of heat that made me want to bury my head in the ground. It was my last day at my job, and I'd been rewarded with half my wage and a crushed piece of chocolate cake wrapped in a napkin. And I threw the cake away and stuffed the crumpled notes in my shorts. I should have been thinking about college that day. I should have been thinking about how the hell I was going to pay for my tuition with barely 300 bucks. But I wasn't. (laughs) Of course I wasn't. Checking my phone, I made sure I blocked my mother as well as my aunt and uncle. Oh, Dad wasn't in the picture. Not much to say. Never knew him. Checking and rechecking the time, I pulled off my work polo and stuffed it in the trash. I spent the last hours of my shift scanning through Spider-Man comics. They were popular again, though I had no idea why. Tons of people in my year openly read them, and nobody batted an eyelid. I stepped into the heat that afternoon. I was hopeful, excited. Unlike my classmates and years before us, I had no intention of joining the game, and I had no intention of going to camp. I'd been curious as a kid, but over the years the novelty had worn off. It was my last summer with Nick and Bobby, and I was going to spend every day with them doing what I wanted. I was going to smoke and drink and get freaking high. We spent half the year planning a road trip to Florida, and I was going to use the time away from town to finally come clean to Mom about Bobby. I was going to tell her everything, disappear for the summer, and sneak back in September and grab my things. I didn't have plans for post-summer. I was smart enough for my dream college, but it was my lack of cash. Mom wasn't that well off, and it made it clear that if I wanted to go, I'd pay it myself. The talkie in my hand was store-bought. Nick had thrown it at me the night before. Blinking in dizzying sunlight, I scanned the parking lot. So far, it was clear. I had to be careful. I had no idea why, but the teachers had documented where every student would be on the day of camp. Mom had obviously told them about me being at work, but as for the others, it was a mystery how they knew where they were. Tying my hair into a ponytail, I stepped out into the sticky air that made my skin crawl. I twisted the dial on the talkie and held it to my mouth. Before I could speak, Nick's voice came through in a burst of hissing static. Ah, it's hot. I'm sweating where I shouldn't be sweating. Rolling my eyes, I couldn't resist a smile. We have perfectly good working phones, Nick. What are the talkies for? (laughs) It's fun, he shot back. Hey, you at the store. I'm heading towards the car. He paused. So far, no sign of teachers. I saw Danny Rue and Sadie Lilly run into the woods with a bunch of others. They're skipping out too. Duh, Nick teased. Apparently they're heading to the Big Apple. Sadie's sister lives there. He let out a sharp hiss. Oh, shit. I got visuals on Miss Cater. Oh, she's on the warpath. Just gone past the dry cleaners. I nodded to myself. Right, let's just focus on getting out of here. I started walking, checking for pursuers. According to the mass text the school had sent this morning, all seniors were expected to be on the bus at half past one. It was quarter past. The plan was to get to Nick's car, where we'd stuffed all our bags the night before and step on it. Of course, parents had figured we were going to try and flee town, so our cars had been confiscated. Luckily, though, Nick worked at a junkyard. He'd spent months turning a hunk of junk into a decent enough ride. So we were already one step ahead of them. Starting to jog, I moved across the parking lot. Bobby, are you there? My stomach sunk when the name escaped my lips, a feeling I'd been fighting with ever since we'd met, returning with a vengeance. It wasn't confusion when I'd been 14 and had butterflies. Nope, it was guilt. I'd made a promise that I would tell Mum about us, but Mum was different. She wouldn't understand. She hated the idea of me dating. I took a guy home for dinner in sophomore year, and she politely told him to leave. God knows what Mum was going to do when she found out about Bobby. Hmm? Bobby's voice was soft and smooth, slipping so effortlessly through static like it belonged in there. 
I'm about two minutes away. I'm ready in my mom's kitchen for snacks before I left. Score! Nick whooped. See, this is why I prefer you to Addie. Well, this time I spluttered. <laughs> Take that back. I've been working all morning, asshole. I could hear the grin in his voice. You're not making your case any better. Bobby's voice cut through our laughter. Did you tell your mom about us yet, Addy? I stopped laughing, my footsteps faltering. The sun was a bastard baking into my back, and I struggled to speak through the breath caught in my throat. Um, I was struggling to coerce basic words out when I caught a movement in the corner of my eye. Expecting it to be a teacher, I started backing away, lowering my hand holding the talkie. But then I glimpsed familiar blonde curls tied into pigtails, catching the sun almost perfectly. Well, the figure wasn't that far away, but I saw all of her and I felt myself shatter. I wanted to tell Mum. I really did. But it was hard. Bobby, Robin Atwood, was the first girl I fell for. First girl that made me believe in love, as dumb as it sounds. Even after dating for almost five months, I lost my breath when I caught sight of her. But I still smiled, I couldn't help it. It's hard not to smile. Bobby was beautiful like every other kid in town, and I was still struggling to figure out how she liked someone like me. It was far from the definition of beauty, or even pretty. Oh, cute, okay looking, but I had a stubby nose and my eyes were too far apart. My dark hair the only thing hiding my huge forehead. Put it simply, I wasn't attractive. I'm not going to say I was the only one. I mean, bad eggs existed in Aceville. No, I wasn't the only one. It just sucked that my parents had given me sucky genes. Bobby. My voice sort of broke when I said her name, and I hated that. That made it obvious that I hadn't told Mum. Well, Bobby was out, and she told her mother when we started dating. And I'd chickened out. Luckily, my mom didn't talk to Bobby's. If she did, forget camp, I'd probably be at military school. Bobby's smile was soft. She was wearing her favorite dress and battered converse. Not exactly the best outfit to escape town in. Instead of talking about my mom, she pulled me into a quick hug and laced her fingers in mine. She reached one hand into her tote bag hanging from her shoulder and pulled out a pack of M&Ms, waving them in my face with a smirk. They were my favourite. Oh, I love the peanut ones. Yeah, I did get you these, since you promised, but sure, I'll meet them on my own. I scoffed, shoving her when she laughed. You bitch. All right, I'll give them to Nick. I tried to snatch the pack off of her, but he doesn't even like them. Oh, Bobby was fast, and so were her instincts. Before I could grab them, she'd shoved them in her bag. We should get going. At that moment, all the dread eating me up inside slipped away. I pulled Bobby into a run, and we left the parking lot, darting across the street. I could hear yelling in the distance. It was no doubt our classmates either getting caught or pulling a fast one. Nick, I said into the talkie. You close? To my surprise, there was no answer. Nick had found every opportunity to use these darn things, so it was odd that he wasn't answering. Bobby tried her talkie. Nick, are you there? The junkyard was a five-minute walk, and maybe a two-minute run if we sprinted. Well, Nick wasn't answering, and the closer we got to the junkyard, well, a bad feeling started to coil in the pit of my gut. When I slowed down, bending over with my hands on my knees, gasping into humid air, Bobby tried to contact Nick again. She shook the talkie with a frown. Maybe it's faulty. I fixed her with a sceptical look. Both of them? Shaking my head, I straightened up and pulled my phone out of my shorts. Twenty-five past. The teachers were most likely doing a head count and were already on the prowl. I was shaking with adrenaline. We should get to the car, I gasped out. Our best case scenario is the idiot got distracted or broke the talkie. We shouldn't assume the worst. Bobby nodded, though her smile was thin. When we started running again, our shoes pounding the steaming tarmac, I felt a rush of deja vu. My ponytail flew behind me, and I pumped my arms and legs hard, propelling my body faster. I was just like Clara, except unlike her, I was going to make it.
At least, that's what I thought. The junkyard was in my sight when the talkie crackled with static. I was frowning at the mass of beaten up cars covered in dirt and old engines when an all too familiar voice filled the air. Adelie and Carlstone and Robin Atwood. The voice of our math teacher, Mr. Fuller, sent shivers crawling up my spine. I felt sick. There was no way he'd tracked us down that fast. How was that even possible? Suddenly all I could think about was Clara. All I could think about was the way she was dragged, kicking and screaming, and that class had treated it like a joke, a game. That was until it was our turn. Mr. Fuller's voice was stern. I suggest abandoning whatever plan you have of making your way to the school bus, please. When I was considering smashing the talkie against the gravel sidewalk, he continued. Your friend Nick Castor is a good runner, I'll give him that. But not fast enough, I'm afraid. Asshole. Nick's voice came through loud and clear, but it was too clear. Twisting around, my heart dropped into my gut. Nick's voice wasn't just clear on the talkie. It was close. Too close. I froze. Bobby pulled her hand from mine and squeaked, her hand slapping over her mouth. When I saw the two of them shuffling towards us... Mr. Fuller dragging Nick. I had the split-second thought of grabbing Bobby and running for it. But I wasn't going to leave my best friend. It didn't take long before the three of us were rounded up. Nicholas Castor was the type of guy who shouldn't have been as close to me as he was. He was varsity captain of the Aceville Aardvarks and, like Bobby, was pretty attractive with dark curls contrasting pale skin and freckles dotting his cheeks. Oh, the restraint's really necessary, Nick spat when he was cuffed and pushed into the back of Mr. Fuller's car. Well, some might call it kidnapping, but in Aceville on July 16th, it was the norm. The car ride didn't take long and was uncomfortable. The three of us were squashed like sardines, Nick's legs sticking into my bag, Bobby's head on my shoulder. When we got to school, we were thankfully uncuffed and transferred to the bus. I wasn't expecting us to be the ones they were waiting on. Even Sadie and Danny had been caught. When I was making my way to the back of the bus, keeping a tight hold of Bobby's hand and Nick's sleeve, we were greeted to a deluge of faces. Some kids held their hand up for high fives, which Nick happily slapped, but the majority of them looked disappointed. If we'd failed to escape, then it really was impossible. There was no way out. And camp was inevitable. I found a seat quickly, right at the back, pulling Nick and Bobby next to me. Well, that failed. Nick let out a nervous laugh when the bus started moving. I was frowning at two men dressed in black that had jumped on last minute. They didn't look like anyone I knew. The two of them stationed themselves at the front. They made me feel strange, like they weren't supposed to be here. Well, I had no choice but to settle down in my seat and let the nauseating movements of the bus send my stomach hurtling into my throat. Nick pulled out his switch and Bobby lay her head against the window. I guess none of them wanted to talk, though I couldn't blame them. When my phone rang an hour into the journey, I switched it off without looking at the screen. I don't know how long we were on the bus, but at points I felt like we were going around in circles. I could have sworn we'd passed the same sign, but when I pointed it out, Nick mumbled something unintelligible, far too invested in one of the new Pokemon games, and Bobby had fallen asleep. Outside, the sky had turned dark. Now, I could have been wrong, but I was sure we'd been on the bus for hours, and nobody was questioning it. The lights above flickered, and around me, my classmates were either asleep or had earphones corked in. When we came to an abrupt stop, Bobby and Nick, as well as our class, seemed to snap out of it, the trance-like state that had swallowed them up. They started to ask questions, asking where we were. We were all ignored. Instead, one of the two men I'd spotted earlier stood up and addressed us. Aceville Seniors. He cleared his throat. <clears> throat> my name is Lawrence Shade, and I'm a talent recruiter. 
In a few minutes, you'll watch a small film we've prepared which will give us an idea where to categorize you. Please be aware that watching this film is mandatory. What? Summer Forest laughed. This, this is a joke, right? Isn't this supposed to be can? As soon as the words slipped from my mouth, I pressed my face against the window. It was raining, not pouring. I don't know how I didn't notice. Nick leaned over me and pulled a face. Hey, when did it get dark? Bobby nodded, and she sent me a sharp look. How long have we been on this bus? Before I could answer, a portable TV screen at the back of my seat lit up, with first a white screen, which turned bright green and then yellow, flicking from colour to colour, flashing in my eyes. Nick hissed. What the fuck is this? But he was watching the screen, Bobby too, like it was drawing them in, leeching onto their minds. Murmurs around the bus confirm my classmates were equally confused. I squeezed my eyes shut at first, but I was overcome with an overwhelming sense of curiosity. I let my eyes flutter open, but as soon as my gaze landed on the screen, on the flashing colours, a sharp pain rumbled in my right temple. The colours kept going. I remember the sequence perfectly. Red. Yellow. Blue. Green. Repeat. I don't know how long I was staring at those colours. I don't know how long my body was frozen, my eyes unblinking, but I could feel my body reacting. My mouth was open, unable to close, a thin sliver of drool running down my chin. There was something warm, something wet and warm, sliding from my nostril. I couldn't wipe it away. My body was stuck, like I was paralysed, like I'd never move again. And then, just like that... The screen flashed off. Bobby drew in a sharp breath and straightened in her seat, and Nick blinked rapidly. I expected him to freak out, but he was strangely quiet. Addy! Bobby's whisper was sharp. Your nose! Swiping gingerly at my nose with my bare arm, I let out a shuddery breath. God, we had to get out. Whatever the place was, it wasn't summer camp. I could hear hisses around me, at the back of the bus and the front, voices collapsing into white noise. When I risked turning my head, I spotted Serena Kyle with her hand pressed over her nose and mouth. She was doing a bad job of hiding the crimson stream flooding through her fingers. And suddenly, it felt like my world was crumbling in front of me. The two men started up the aisle, labelling each student. They held cans of spray paint like weapons, marking us with different colours. There were three colours, red, blue and purple. When my classmates tried to protest, tried to make a run for it, they were cuffed and shoved back in their seats. I was so much screaming and fighting, I couldn't hear what the men with the spray paint were saying. Like they were animals, like they were, well, like they were Clara. I couldn't help thinking it. Is this what had happened to her? Nick grabbed my hand and I grabbed Bobby's. Bobby was sobbing quietly, struggling to speak through her sobs. When any of us tried to dial 911, the line was dead. When one of the men reached my classmates in front of me, the front of their shirts were sprayed deep, dark blue. The man studied the three girls like they were pieces of meat. There was a sickening smile on his face. These are all good. He turned and yelled to the front of the bus. The girls he was talking about started talking over each other, but he blanked them. Blues will go into processing first, and then purples if we can fix them. The man's words horrified me. They were like ice seeping into my bones. When he reached me, he grabbed for his can of red paint and sprayed a red circle on the front of my shirt. It was ice cold against my skin, and I had to bite back a scream. I thought he was going to raise his hand to me, but instead he stuck his podgy fingers under the blood crusted under my nose. Defect, he said. What? I hissed out. What? What do you mean? He ignored me, moving on to Nick, this time spraying a purple circle. He seemed to study my friend before grabbing Nick by the scruff of his neck and peering at the boy. Pending, he growled. 
his fingernails grazing over freckles dotted on my best friend's cheeks. Oh, I'm not the one who will make the final choice. You better be as pretty as you seem in good light, boy. Nick looked too stunned to speak. Bobby shrieked when he sprayed a blue circle on the front of her dress. I tried to stop him, but I was dragged by my hair, ragged like a wild animal. This one's good too, he yelled at the front. When the men were finished with the spray cans, we were told to file off the bus and join our respected colour groups. When we tried to run, we were grabbed and thrown off the bus. I'm not sure how much time had passed before I was separated from Nick and Bobby, the two of them dragged away, while I was shoved onto my knees in dirt which stained my legs. It was pouring, and my ponytail was plastered to my back. Other reds were forced next to me. There were around twelve of us in total. I know that because I took snapshots of each of them. Not names. Faces. Names hurt, so I remembered them by face. I do remember Summer Forest next to me. I remember dirt streaked down her face, blood dripping down her chin. That's what we all shared, the reds. We'd all suffered the same nosebleed, crimson streaking down our faces, mixing with the rain. The twelve of us were put in a line in front of the bus, when a woman in a pristine white suit and red hair addressed us under the light of her flashlight. I looked past her, and my gaze found our camp. Well, not a camp. There was no sign of a campsite. The type of thing I'd expected all these years, leading to my senior year. No. Instead, in front of us was a multi-story building. In the distance, groups of purples and blues were being escorted inside automatic doors, while we were left out in the rain for hours. The sky turned light and then dark, and we were made to wait. We could have been there for days, <laughs> lost all sense of time. I lost all sense of my own humanity. Well, I knew why they were doing this to us, but I was in denial. I was in denial when twelve became eleven, and then ten, and then nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Someone was screaming. I couldn't breathe. There were people in front of me. I knew them. I'd known them since childhood. Mr. Doherty, the guy who lived across the street with his poodle, Gloria, Eve Simmons, who owned the diner Nick, Bobby and I had frequented for most of our lives. Mr. and Mrs. State, the elderly couple who brought over pudding when I was homesick from school. Someone I didn't want to believe was there, because I was in denial. But they were, with a gun held in their hand, pointing it between my eyes. I don't know when three became two, each gunshot ricocheting in my skull. All I remember is waiting to follow the others, squeezing my eyes shut and screaming into the night. But then a warm hand was sliding into mine and pulling me up. There was a gunshot and the sound of a body hitting the ground. Summer. I remember Nick pulling me away, but I will never forget Summer Forest's body lying in a heap, pooling red, stemming around willowy blonde hair. I don't know how Nick got me away, but all I recall is tripping over my own feet. He pulled us into trees and undergrowth, and branches scratched at my face and pulled at my hair, but I didn't care. When Nick finally turned around to look at me, I screamed. I screamed until he slammed his hand over my mouth to shut me up. The last time I'd seen my best friend, he had definitely had two eyes, both intact. Now one of them was hanging out. The skin of his face had been scraped away, leaving bloody flaps of flesh where his cheeks used to be. His lips were swollen. Half of his hair sheared off. I got out, he managed to gasp out. It's okay. I got out. They, they had me on a ton of anesthetic, so just bear with me. Out, I shrieked back. Out of where? Nick held his eye inside his socket with one hand and held mine with the other. Processing. What? What are you talking about? Nick pulled me further into the trees. That place, he gasped out. It's... Uh, it's a factory. 
A factory, Nick said. We weren't at a camp. We've been taken to a factory. Clara Danvers and the class of 2016 and every class since have been taken to a factory. We weren't at a fucking camp. We were being turned into something horrific. And I was a defect. They didn't want me. Bobby was still in there. I had to. Oh, fuck. I had to get her out. 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 Oh my god, what's going to happen next? Well, I think it's pretty clear from the end of that one that this is going to be a series. Three parts in total, if I'm, if what I've read is true. Anyway, so, we'll see. Next part coming very soon. Can you wait, can you? Well, you're going to have to, but I'll be getting back to this one very soon, because I'm as intrigued as the rest of you are about this one. Whew, what a way to end a Friday evening. Well, hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, comments in the comment section below the video, as always. I'll do my best to join in the chat. That's it for this evening, so until next time, which will be very soon, very, very sweet dream, some bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.